Because no race has the last word on culture and civilization. They do not know what we are capable of. They do not know what we are thinking. They are thinking in terms of dreadnoughts, battleships, aeroplanes, submarines. You know what we are thinking about? That is our own private business. <laughs> so give us credit for being able to use our minds. And with people becoming conscious of themselves, determined to use their minds, you do not know to what extent they can go. Liberate the minds of men and ultimately you will liberate the bodies of men. Appreciate everybody joining us today, tonight. What's brother. up, brother? What's going on? Uh, what's up, Sujata? What's up, Rhonda? Hey, Miss Christine. Hey, Miss Marona. Hey there. Right. What up, Norrell? I see you. How you doing? <laughs> hey, how y'all doing? What's going on? What's up, Jacob? I see you too now, man. All right. What's up, Ra? What's up, Kwame? What's up, Jerry? What up, bro? Greetings. Right. Yeah, doing all right. Yeah, yeah, we good. What's up, Dr. Yeah. Charlie E? Can't say the last name, but Dr. Charlie E. All right. Hey. Oh, <laughs> what's up, Rachel Mac? That's who that is. All right. Dr. Yeah. Rick, Dr. Charlie E. McAdoos. <laughs> what's poppin'? Hey, uh, I want to welcome y'all. Welcome y'all, man. I uh, appreciate everybody. And hopefully we have some, a few more people joining. But I want to welcome everybody uh, to the Little Rock Freedom Front Day of Action. Were y'all able to hear that video that I was playing? No? No. Okay. I heard it. Who heard it? Ramona. Okay. You heard the video. Okay. So some people couldn't hear the video. I heard it like it was in and out. Yeah, it was going in and out. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I got you. I didn't know that. I, I wasn't checking the chat when I was showing it. But I'll, I'll share a link of that in the chat. That's basically, uh, that was basically a speech about, uh, from Marcus Garvey, who, Today is his birthday. Happy birthday to Marcus Garvey. This is Marcus Garvey Day. And it's a perfect way to talk about what we're going to be doing today. Uh, and, um, you know, so uh, I'll share that video with y'all. But the, the importance of this discussion is to talk about Black empowerment and supporting Black-led organizations. And not only that, it is Black Philanthropy Month, too, as well. And so this has been a day where I've been sharing the message about the work of the Freedom Fund, and I'm asking people to, to just donate uh, whatever they could to the Little Rock Freedom Fund today. You know, Ryan has kind of been keeping up with that. But we just wanted to basically just let y'all know we still are around, we're doing work. And we also want to make sure we had a discussion about the work that we're doing in the future, giving up uh, and give an update on our founder uh, and director, Don Jeffrey. And so um, I want to make sure that y'all are aware of what we've been doing. Since, uh, since 2020, Summer Resistance, Little Rock Freedom Fund has been an organization that is helping with direct action, Know Your Rights workshops, trainings. Uh, we've been helping with bail disruption and uh, bail support, legal support. And also uh, over the last year or so, we've been also doing voter education voter engagement and help the registered voters here to help cultivate civic engagement as well. So, um, that's just a little bit about what we're doing right now. We always want to make sure we lift up Don Jeffrey, the founder, who's currently been incarcerated for over a year um, from charges that stem from the summer of resistance in the year 2020. And so uh, right now we'll just, we're just awaiting sentencing. Um, and I want to make sure that we make space. Uh, Don's mother is here, Miss Christine. And if you want to give any updates, I know Ashley said she might join a little bit later. Uh, but if you want to give any updates on what's going on with Don and the people who are here right now, uh, definitely get off mute if you want to and share an update. Hello, everybody. How's, how's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. How you doing? 
Yes, ma'am. Doing all right. Yeah, Brittany's doing okay. Uh, well, she's doing as as well as she can be doing in the situation she's in. Uh, they'll start visitation. Um, I think it's the first and the third Friday, and this will be the first time uh, this Friday where she'll be able to receive uh, visitors. So it's like three visitors, like for for Friday. That's it. You know, so uh, Ashley and the kids are going to go Friday and then uh, the next time I'll go, I'll, I'll be able to go. Uh, but at least she'll be able to see her daughter, you know, this Friday. Uh, this is, I think, going on the seventh appeal, you know, for her that uh, Judge Velope has denied for basically the same reasons he did before, you know, personal reasons you know, because uh, he feels that she's she's going to do the same thing when she gets out, you know, marijuana. <laughs> but um, so he's, uh, so the attorneys, again, are putting in a, another appeal, and I think they put it in last week, but I need to get another update from them. I requested another update, but they, uh, most of the time, they're being denied um, access to her. You know, they've limited the, uh, the amount of time the attorneys can spend with her now. So that's a, that alone is violating her rights as well. So, but we're just continuing to um, keep our hopes up. Hopefully that she'll be able to get out of there. She does not have a sentencing date yet. Uh, so I'm just praying that when the time comes that it'll, they'll say time served and let her on out. But if you guys can just continue to keep her in your prayers. And that's, that's pretty much all that I have right now. Okay. Hey, thank you, Miss Christine. I, I really appreciate you joining us tonight and giving us that update. I just got one question for you, and maybe you can ask this, because uh, I was going to ask Ashley. Uh, is there still a need to gather any more uh, character letters for her, or will be done gathering character letters? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. We, we, we have uh, quite a bit. Thank you all for the ones who have written letters. But yes, you can still continue to write the character letters where uh, the attorney sent us a file. So we upload them uh, directly into that file. So if you have uh, Ashley's email address, I think she put it on. I'm not sure she put it on Facebook. Uh, but if you have Ashley's email address, which is Ashley Jeffrey at ymail.com you can send the, uh, the the letters to her and then we'll upload them into the file so yeah they're, they're still needed but we need them as soon as possible though all right yeah we've received quite I'm sorry, go ahead. I said we have received quite a bit and I thank you guys for, for, for getting those letters in yeah all right. Thank you, Miss Christine, for that update. We're going to continue to keep lifting Don up. And, uh, Thank you, guys. And uh, making sure that uh, she's coming home soon. So I did put that information in the chat. Uh, oh, good. You want to send character letters? Email address for her sister, Ashley Jeffrey, is in the chat. And if you need a format, uh, just let me know. And I can, that, that's a little bit longer. And I can email you a format if you need a on how to instruction on how to write a character. That's, yeah, and actually put out a format as well. Yeah, I'm just copying and pasting her format. Okay, okay then. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Miss Christine. I appreciate everybody uh, that's that's in here today. And if uh, you know, what I'm saying, you have any questions about anything Little Rock Freedom Fund has going on, uh, feel free to to message any of us. Uh, but I want to basically, we're going to try to start things off on a, on a real uplifted note. And so, uh, like I said, this is Little Rock Freedom Fund day or night of action. And we've been pressing the message. I've been pressing the message on social media about supporting Little Rock Freedom Fund. And one thing we definitely love to support is the people in the community, but we love to support the artists as well. So without any further ado, I want y'all to enjoy some live entertainment from some of the dopest entertainers that we have around here. I'm talking about the righteous poets. So y'all go on mute. 
Everybody go on YouTube poets <laughs> and enjoy a little bit of this spoken word from Norrell, yeah. Jacob, and Jamie. Yeah. Norrell, Jamie, and Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Thank you, Osiris, um, for having us, but also just for always supporting us and whatever the righteous is doing and collabing with us in the community. We really do value that relationship with the arts, but then also with the community. So we're happy to have you in our network and everybody else here that we know. We're gonna do, we're each gonna do a poem for y'all um, right now. Um, I'm Jamie McAdoo and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm no real McAdoo, um, the oldest member in the Righteous Poets. Uh, I'm Jacob Cunningham, uh, J Slim, you know, the one and only, you know what I'm saying, you know, me, you know. Apparently, y'all know, y'all know, know. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. Um, this poem is entitled Lesson Still Relevant. We all graduated from the historical Little Rock Central High School. So during yeah, the Central Rock. Central Rock. So during the um, 60th desegregation of Little Rock Central High School, we were very involved in all of the things going on for the commemoration events. So this was one of the poems that we did. We also uh, had the great opportunity to meet with eight of the living Little Rock Nine and talk about that living history and learn from them. And this is one of the poems that came out of that. Yeah. And before you go, Jay, uh, so we got this one thing when we do poetry is called feedback. So normally when we're in person, you might snap or you might say, ooh. Mm. Mm, or you might say, ooh, ah. So we on Zoom right now. That might be a little difficult. But I know one thing that we can do, we do have these little reactions on Zoom. So if you want to put a little thumbs up, a heart, a laughing emoji, a clapping emoji, whatever you feel, if you hear something that you like, uh, when a we fire speak. emoji, we see you, Osiris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. Fire there, emoji, boy. anything right there. Yeah, we'll know y'all still engaged and y'all listening and tapped in. Yes, and also the chat. You can always do the, well, I think so. Yes, you can also utilize the chat. Okay, so this is entitled Lesson Still Relevant. My parents were my first history teachers. At an early age, in my earliest days, I was taught the culture behind my race, the beauty beyond my face, the common inventions and ways of living that we can trace back to Africa. See, I knew about the brotherhood that was taken from the motherland. My mother's hands never tamed my natural roots. My mother's hands held me as we watched roots. My father's glance compelled me to pay attention to roots. My brother and I washed eyes on the prize. My brother and I watched documentaries that showed Martin Luther King die, Emmett Till die, black people die in America, black people die, my brother and I watched the news as Trayvon Martin's parents cried. My parents took us to museums and we observed the gyms. They took us to lectures and we listened back then. They taught us about Central High School too, way before we went to school. And in a way, I felt like the 10th Little Rock Nine from behind, the little sister of them all, the fly on the wall, the shadow on call, and I saw how they were treated. And I saw how they retreated and nine violently fought the system that fought them back 10 times harder. I saw because I am the daughter of the movement. I knew this at an early age, so by ninth grade, I expected attending Central High to be iconic, to be as if I would be a part of history. I represent the third wave generation after the desegregation. It's amazing that it wasn't that long ago. I know that we have come from a long ways, but we still have a ways to go. But at least in Arkansas, we can say it started at Central High where I was not one of nine black students in a school of nearly 3,000, a place that has over 20 languages and counting, a school where I was not greeted every day with 2468. We don't want to integrate shoutings. In 1957, Central High was the beginning of change. And I knew this at an early age. I mean, in my earliest days, because my parents were my first history teachers. We're going to keep it rolling and pass it on to Norella J. Yeah. Uh, thank you. All right. All right. All right. That was some heat. That was some heat. That's hard to follow up. That's going to be hard to follow up. Good. Um, that was a good poem, Jamie. This poem is called Whack Privilege. Uh, it's really, it's really short. Um, it's not really that long, but yeah, I hope y'all like it. Why do we focus on the negative? 
Talk about times are terrible. We inhale chemicals. The whites aren't forgettable and police aren't acceptable. I mean, all that's true, but what about the good stuff? All we hear about is how women act tough, loud and ghetto. Yes, all that type of stuff. Why, again, why are we focused on the negative? Why do we pay attention to the, why do we pay attention to the women who behave so rough? What about the one that frees slaves? Now, what about the one that got kicked off the bus? And the males, we aren't getting any love either. All we hear about is how we poor and violent and don't have no food in our fridge. What about the one that got 20? 5,000 people to walk across the bridge. I mean, haven't we come a long way with our options? 200 years ago, this would have been an auction. That would have been sold for $400 just to pick cotton. And yet, all we do is focus on the bad. As the race, we used to be broken, but now we have a cast. Remember where you come from, but stop dwelling on the past because every test we have taken as a race, we have passed. Thank you. That's, uh, okay, that's, okay, that's okay, 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 okay. So now it's gonna be hard to follow that, you know, <laughs> two two fire pieces right there. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try my best. This poem, I'm gonna keep it in focusing on the on the on the positive, like like Jacob just said. So uh, this poem is uh, called Resilience. R, rare. Wait, resilience. R is rare to see my people quit. I come from generations of genius survivors who show no weakness and people who are reflections of Jesus. E. Mm. Everything started with us. We were the first mathematicians, first scientists, first architects, labeled archaic, but they're still amazed by pyramids that haven't faded. S. Strength. My ancestry chest pressed depression. Built a country that doesn't accept them while never putting God in the question. I never cease to be amazed by our blessings. Forgiveness is our strongest weapon. L. Loss. We've lost so many in this war, but never any hope. And that strikes fear in the enemy's heart and they just can't come to cope. I know for a fact that I'm proud to be black. E, excellence runs through my veins. And no one knows that pain, that constant struggle. Oh, the beauty and the ugliness, the beauty, I mean, the creation of our brilliance, the reason for our resilience. C, capable. I wouldn't put anything past my people. The underestimation makes us lethal. One day we will gain freedom from this evil. It's only so long that we remain peaceful. E, they tried to lock us away, but we're as free as eagles. Resilience. What? Yeah. So yeah, we are the Righteous Poets, and you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, at um, Be Righteous. Uh, but Jamie will put all our tags in the chat uh because because that that way y'all can see it in writing because it's we spell righteous a, a creative way just how we are okay <laughs> yeah so that was our first little set i know that we're here celebrating marvis garvey day and we're all here because we believe in the empowerment and of black people and of the community so we do have some more poetry for y'all later today but thank y'all for tuning in for the right now all right, thank you, Righteous Poets, Jamie, J. Slim, and CEO Norrell. I like how Jamie always can be a little co-host with you, always facilitate things. That's what's up, but thanks to the Righteous Poets. Hey, she keep hey, us on track. She keep us on track, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. That's the manager, that's the manager slash one of the lead artists. I see that. I see the, I see the vision. Oh. Uh -huh. But yeah, they're going to be back a little bit later, you know what I'm saying, with a little bit more heat. And they're going to be here with us for a conversation too as well. And I just want to go ahead and get into our panelists. This panel, we put it together to show the importance that of supporting our Black-led organizations here in Arkansas and just in the nation. Uh, Marcus Gar believed in the unity of global, global unity of Black people all around this world. And with the principles of peace, love, and harmony, human rights, human sympathy, human justice, you know, these are the things that were going to propel us to a greater place in this world and for us to be self sufficient. So I want to introduce every panelist that we have. Um, and, you know, saying we'll get into this conversation. So, uh, first up, we got Clarice Abdul Bay. Teresa Abdul Bay is Afro Indigenous and native of Little Rock, Arkansas. He's the co director of the Washita Foothills Youth Media and Arts and Liter uh, Literacy Collective and co convener of the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement. As a lifelong youth mentor and youth advocate, Clarice is, art is ardent about facilitating students in the areas of social emotional learning and the use of so solution based journalism, interviewing skills, and what she likes to call active, empathetic listening techniques. In 2021, she was a U.S. cohort in building a diverse and inclusive cultural and remembrance of 
inclusive culture of remembrance virtual exchange fellowship a program uh, a program created by cultural vistas in partnership with the heinrich bowl foundation he's a proud americorps alum in service direct and vista in the areas of security justice and uh, capacity building she's a racial justice facilitator mental health first aider and a mindfulness relationships practitioner passionate about well-being uh passionate about wellness integration in workspaces advocacy and social justice issues and so uh this is clarice abdul bay and my first question to every panelist after i give you an introduction is in the phrase in solidarity what did this what does this work look like for you the question for me yes <laughs> In solidarity, um, always that we are working united with one another uh, for a common cause. And so um, whatever that cause is, whatever that belief is, whatever that thought process is, and right now we are talking about, uh, you know, all of the principles of Marcus Garvey. And we're in solidarity right now with one another and the community. So it just, you know, just rallying around a common cause for the greater, uh, greater good of everyone in the community. Thank you, Clarice. Our, ne our next panelist is Brittany Gray. Uh, Brittany Gray is a human rights activist and organizer. Brittany has worked on issues such as labor, politics, race, education, economic democracy, and economic de democracy and justice, criminal justice, mass incarceration, hunger, climate justice, and poverty, along with anything that aligns itself within the scope of human rights. Brittany has held national, state, and regional organizer roles with prominent nonprofits and political campaigns. Brittany does not hesitate to offer her skill set to the community in which she lives in, in lives as an evident in her community involvement, participating in various organizations and programs, working and focusing on the studies has always intensified Brittany's attitude towards hard work and desire for excellence. Brittany is currently a regional organizer with the national nonprofit Community Change and an adjunct professor at Mississippi Valley State University. Brittany advocates for people of all races, genders, and ethnic ethnicities, economic and social classes through research and practice. His mission is to draw on continuing spiritual insights and working with people of many backgrounds as they nurture into the seeds of change and respect for human life that transform social relations and systems that strongly correlate with her personal values. Brittany is a graduate of University of Mississippi with a BA in English and uh, CUNY Brooklyn with an MA in political science. She is currently a doctoral candidate at Mississippi State University. Brittany is the founder of Community. Community, T is spelled with a T A T E A L L C, a company that prides itself on creating herbal remedies to promote healing in communities. Brittany Gray, what's good with you? Tell me with the phrase in solidarity, what does that work? What does that look like for you with your work? Yeah, how y'all doing? Um, when I think about being into the in solidarity, um, one of the things that definitely comes into mind is uh, collectivity, right? Um, really aligning ourselves together and moving towards one common goal, as Sister Clarice pointed out, um, just and moving with intention, um, but most of all, out of love, right? Um, I think when we say in solidarity, we also have to be um consider it of the fact that we're gonna struggle uh with each other we might fall out we might have disputes we may have uh different ways of doing things but uh it has to be a collective struggle um rooted in love right um in order for us to continue to be in solidarity and to build uh powerful movements across this country um i'd say you know just to wrap it up that in solidarity means just uh moving in a way and resisting in a way that is deeply rooted in in love for our people um and that will drive us uh to be uh as one right and so thank you Brittany. 
And our last speaker, uh, Omavi Shakur. Omavi Shakur is an attorney, practitioner, residence, and research scholar at the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thoughts Initiative for a Justice Society. He also holds an appointment as Associate Research Scholar at Columbia Law School. Omavi conducts research at the intersection of criminal law, criminal procedure, critical race theory, and critical legal studies. He's a forthcoming law review article. He has a forthcoming law review article, the Criminalization of Black Resistance, that examines how laws that criminalize resisting arrest harden white social dominance and deepen black racial uh, subordination. This article also discusses the need for transformative, non-punitive interventions that eradicate the harms animating black resistance to the policing. Uh, I'm gonna skip down that bio a little bit more. And I uh, just say that Omavi is a, a board member and works with the Little Rock, works for the Little Rock Freedom Fund as well. Well known in the community of Little Rock, Arkansas, and a good friend of mine, uh, Omavi Shakur. In solidarity, that phrase. What does that look like for you with your work? Yeah, bro. I would have sent you the two sentence bio if I knew you was going to read it. All I was like, I just copy and paste the website. Um, <clears throat> But not in solidarity for me uh, means that <clears throat> I recognize that we are are distinct. We have unique positionalities, um, but also recognize that we are in relation to each other as well. Uh, and it recognizes that sort of everybody is in relation to each other, and that. When it comes to addressing our oppression, instead of you know fighting over hierarchies of oppression, that we are concerned primarily about discerning our relationships of oppression uh, and, and working together um, towards the common goal of liberation. All right, thank you, old Bobby. Um, and I appreciate all of the panelists and speakers that have agreed to be with us today. We are, we all, I have worked with all of them in some type of capacity over the last couple of years. So I appreciate them. I know they're all busy. And so we're just going to keep this conversation flowing. Happy Marcus Garvey Day. This is a day for us to embrace Black empowerment and help to stress the importance of supporting our Black organizers and our organizations in our community. Uh, we have to stress that empower each other we have to try to uh to understand that this social this movement for social change and social justice is starting starts with us to the ends with us and so we have to make sure that that we're about doing this work together collectively uh my first question i'm gonna just hit you out the gates um you know what i'm saying uh with black led organizations only receive about two percent of the $60 billion in foundation funding. So my question to all the panelists are, what are some ways that we can decolonize the wealth, as well as start stressing the importance of donor support in our communities so that we have the resources not only to survive, but to thrive? And I'm gonna put that out there to anybody. And if you have a response to that question, please put it in the chat if you're not a speaker. I'll read that off, but uh, I'm going to just throw that up in the air. Do you ever want to answer that first? I'll take a stab at it. Um, for me, I think it's the it's the, the thought about what this movement is of mutual aid and how important mutual aid is um, for us and that um, we, we're long past charity. I think um, mutual aid is something that we have to get our minds wrapped around and working together to support one another in different ways uh, in the work. Um, there's an organization in uh, Mutual Aid Toledo that I was reading about, and they were comparing charity and mutual aid. And some of the things were, you know, about uh, charity being about member donorship and, and mutual aid being about members are making the decisions. They're not just uh, receiving donorship, they're making decisions 
they are pooling resources, uh, they are uh, accountable to the community. And um, so I think if we're going to, if, if we're looking at donor, ship and and receiving funds in that way then we need to be really thinking about the process of mutual aid between organizations and one another um, and supporting one another in ways that most large organizations who are giving funds are not thinking about um, and how we can sustain one another and sustainable practices um, are very important right now uh, Kwame's on the phone, on the Zoom, and I know he was doing a study uh, in his IPS feed about uh, Black entrepreneurship in the state of Arkansas and also uh, a Black uh, Chamber of Commerce that um, I guess he can talk about a little bit during question and answers. Uh, and there are organizations who are doing that. Remix Ideas is doing that. I think he was doing that in collaboration with uh, Benito Lubaziwa and Remix Ideas and some other organizations. And so that's something that's in the minds of Black organizations and being able to um, being able to uh, have a mother organization that will help filter out that mutual aid to everyone else and us kind of rally around that, that ideology and that idea. Um, Susu economics is another thing, and I guess I'm gonna stop so my comrades can kind of talk and, and, um, and, and filter in or, or, or actually add to what I'm saying. But yeah, that's what I think we need to be thinking about. I think um, one of the, and I have this conversation with Osiris quite often about the difficulties of working in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, but I think if if I'm going to be true to uh, this struggle, right, that we talked that I talked about a little bit earlier, um, and being in the struggle for our folks. It's imperative that we have people on the inside of these organizations as well, right? Um, to challenge um, the way the systems that have been in place for a very long time that have been very inequitable uh, with regard to resources and how they trickle down to our black led organizations and into our black communities. And so I think um, I've learned over the years a little bit of trial and error um, and just having very solid mentors that have said, stop running from this place and find your place within it, right? Um, and so that has been very helpful in terms of being in a position to help steer resources um, to um, a lot of the black led organizations. I also think that uh, we also have to, I'm from Mississippi. And so we have to get back to our old school organizing models. And I know we're here to celebrate Brother Marcus Garvey. So we're talking about how he organized in the most rural places as well, how this message began to resonate. But thinking about um, how we humanize one another um, and find value, everybody has value. So find that value so that we can just speak candidly to one another, uh, be in community with one another. Uh, but I think one of the organizing tactics back in the day was that we really, we really supported one another. And so whether that was in the form of providing some housing, providing food while people were out doing this work, providing transportation, we've got to get back to some of these methods in order to really support uh, grassroots efforts on the ground and local organizers. Uh, I'm headed to Ohio this week. and. I'm getting some free housing some from someone who uh, worked with me on a different campaign, but that's going to allow me to be able to stay and continue to build with some good folks in Akron, Ohio, right? And so I think that that's one of the things that we have kind of stepped away from in figuring out how to really truly support one another um, in this work. And it has become very siloed. So I think that we have to break down those barriers and get back to um, really thinking about 
how can you help your neighbor, right? Um, and we have to do that both internally uh, within our nonprofit spaces and be vocal advocates in those spaces because they're hard spaces to work in. They're hard spaces to move around resources sometimes, but it, 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 there's an, always an op opportunity to um, provide examples and to educate those in leadership as well. And even if it takes force for us to be resistant um, in those positions uh, to kind of shift the thinking of leadership or shift leaders out, right? Um, we have to be prepared to do that. I think, I think all of that makes sense. Um, I think it's also important not to um, to lose sight of, so what was that figure again, Osiris, of Black-led organizations getting foundation? Uh, yeah, Black-led organizations get about 2% of the $60 billion in foundation. Right, and so $60 billion is, you know, so all of the foundation funding, $60 billion, is like a drop in the bucket, right? And so it's important not to lose sight that we're in a multiple trillion dollar economy, right? And there's $60 billion that all of these organizations are fighting over, right? And these $60 billion that all these organizations are fighting over um, are controlled by the same people who are underdeveloping our communities, right? These foundations are named after Ford, you know, Henry Ford, right, who was a Nazi sympathizer, Carnegie, who was a monopolist who, you know, exploited Chinese labor and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you, on and on and on. They're, they're, they're named after so Rockefeller, right? <laughs> um, but named after sort of these, these capitalists that made um, fortunes off of exploiting our ancestors' labor, exploiting the lands of this country, um, and, and, and building upon the capital that was built by our ancestors. And so I think that even if we got every single you know, dollar of that 60 billion um, number, that it would still be woefully inadequate to reach, to, to meet our needs. Um, and so, of course, you know, I say this as somebody who's getting paid from grant funding. Um, you know, it's a survival mechanism. Uh, and, and we should not treat it as if it's the end goal, right? right? Um, on, the, on the plantation, our ancestors had survival mechanisms. Right, they would go to the slaver and say, "Hey, you know, don't work us so hard; it's going to hurt your bottom line." Right? Hey, you know, improve living conditions because if living conditions aren't better, then you know we won't be able to work, and that's going to hurt your profit. Right? Those were survival mechanisms, but but we shouldn't lose sight of you know we're we're, we're being sort of exploited, oppressed in large part by racial capitalism. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, that, that yes, as a survival mechanism, we need to get all this foundation funding we can get. Um, but at the same time, we have to realize that, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's no liberation for us within, you know, the, the horrible wealth disparities that we're existing in. And if you hear that music, it's because I'm in Brooklyn and uh, there's like a revival happening outside of my window. So, <laughs> but that's my answer. Already, we're going to let you uh, rock out in Brooklyn and, and do, what you, do what you need to do. You know what I'm saying? When it's time to go. Um, but yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Appreciate your answers on that. And I see Kwame added, uh, just as this month is Black August, it is also. Black Phil uh, Philanthropy Month, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, we need to remix these two ideas together and revisit our historical nature of creating and sustaining mutual benefit organizations like the Mosaic Tempers of America, as well as our finance institutions that incorporate things like SUSU economics. Hey, we can talk about that SUSU, for real. Talk about how folks take something 
concept, an African concept, and then totally flip it for their own purposes. We need to get back to what it was originally meant for. But thank you, Kwame Abdul Bay. Um, and like I said, if you got questions or comments, please feel free to drop them in the chat. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, uh, my next question uh, to to the panelists, you know, uh, like we, we mentioned that this is this is Marcus Garvey's birthday, and uh, we're thinking about the principles that Marcus Garvey uh, that he had for the UNIA, um, as well as Pan Africanism. And uh, I just want to know uh, what are some ways, and uh, Brittany, you were kind of getting at this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you start it off. But what are some ways we as a black led organ organizations can improve our outreach? Definitely, like I said, number one is I I think we have to dispel classism for one. Um, really see the value in everybody um, in our own communities. Um, like we don't have to get along, but as long as we love each other, we need to learn, focus more on supporting one another. But I think too, sometimes we overthink what outreach is, right? We live in an age of technology where folks are texting uh, very quickly. You can, it's so easy to text folks in your phone, send them um, a message. Um, it's so easy to pick up the telephone. Uh, children now have tablets uh, <laughs> at very young ages. It's ways that we can use technology to really focus on the outreach. But most importantly, it is the face-to-face -face interaction, right? Um, having conversations, having panel discussions like this, right? Consistently in our areas and in our communities um, in an effort to really get people to raise their critical consciousness about some of these same issues that we're talking about, right? Once we start to question things, and I tell my students that all the time, once you start to really think about things and question them, you're going to be a bad person out here in this world, right? You're going to consistently push back and, and resist in ways in which some folks are not prepared for us, right? Um, and so I think when we think about outreach, it's as simple, you know, the same tactics that we use in a lot of different campaigns and in the nonprofit sector through technology, door knocking, telephone, um, but most importantly, just being real and having conversations and being inclusive of everybody, inviting folks into the space, creating a seat at the table for them to be uh, uh, as participatory as they can be, right? Um, I think a lot of our places, a lot of our spaces have become very exclusive. And most of that is because of us, and the classism that we wear on our, proudly wear on our sleeves, right? Uh, folks are out there repping it like you said. So um, I think that we just have to get back to really focusing and love on one another and staying true to each other. I'll echo what Brittany said about classism. And I think it was Killer Mike that said, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember him talking about uh, PhDs and GEDs being at the same table. Was it Killer Mike? Somebody put it in the chat if I'm wrong, but one of them, the great speakers of our time um, uh, and entrepreneurs of our time. <laughs> Say, Brittany. Well, I know, I know uh, Mama Fannie Lou Hamer always said that whether you had a PhD or no D, we're all in the same <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A no D. We need to be at the table with one another and not looking at the letters behind the names to try to see if the person ha is intellectual or smart enough to speak on a topic or an issue or an idea. I think we get caught up in that. Um, for us, historically, education is the key to uh, liberation of freedom, at least of what we think it is. And so I think we get caught up in, in that classist thing, like Brittany was saying, in that we uh, start looking down on one another uh, intellectually, and instead of understanding that there is this intellectual, um, um, there's different intellectual levels, like we don't have to be smart in books, we can also be smart in emotional intellect. Uh, we can also be emotionally 
uh, integrated. And, and so we need to be able to, to look at different areas of intellect when it comes to people, different levels, and respect each other uh, for what we can bring to the table. And so it's just like being in a movement. All pieces are important. Uh, from the strategy and the organizer to the person bringing cold water, everybody's um, input is important. And so I think we need to value that. Um, and I'm with Brittany in being more uh, equitable when it comes to different folks. I mean, we have to capitalize on, and I hate to use the, that term, but I will say uh, for lack of a better one or, or rather, use resources that we have. And so if I'm sitting at a table and I have to talk to somebody about food security and that person is uh, from a large corporation, I don't necessarily un believe in the values of that person. However, this person is about to make, uh, is about to help with opening the door for my community to do better and to thrive. I'm talking to that person. And so I think we need to be more open to that and not be so closed into, well, I don't believe what this person is doing, so I'm not going to um, talk with them about what is mutually available for everyone else to benefit from. Not changing what you yourself and your organization are trying to do, but to use the resources that are out there. You. Yeah, I, I agree with most of what's been said in terms of um, really coming to people from a place of humility. Um, I, I think to that point is, you know, speaking with people, not speaking to people. Um, you know, people who are directly impacted by the issues that we're concerned about, you know, they're, they're the experts in their experience. And so sometimes if they, people come at them and just try to teach them about their experience and not listen to sort of their lived experience, um, off-putting. Also, I think meeting people's material needs, helping people meet their own material needs, right? That's what the Panthers did. Um, and, you know, to Clarice's point, mutual aid is, is a way of doing that. So not just coming straight with the political education, but also, you know, a, engaging in some sort of mutual aid, which, you know, we're, we're trying to do with the Freedom Fund. So Clarice, you know, tap in. Um, <clears throat> but um, doing that in conjunction with the political education and making sure the political education is a dialogue and not being afraid to be changed ourselves in the process um, is key. And the final thing I'll say is, you know, so in addition to being humble, uh, meeting people's material needs, um, you know, also having a, a sort of a, a, a long view of this, right? Because, Sometimes, you know, well, we we could get our people into something that's a sort of a, a quick fix, but it's not that durable, right? And so, you know, the classic example of this is when, um, you know, people uh, or organizations present training opportunities, right? So opportunities for you know impoverished people to get trained in a certain skill, but at the end of the training program. There's no, there are no jobs available, right? Uh, and, and people don't have the capital needed to, you know, start up businesses and they can't get a loan because they don't have, a, you know, because they might have a felony conviction. And then all of a sudden the community that presented this training opportunity or the organization that present this training opportunity loses credibility, right? Because of it. Classic example in Little Rock is, so the, the 12th Street police substance that was built as going to be this big economic hub and have all these, you know, um, you know, shops and stuff 
now it's, it's just a, it's just like a part of the settler colonial state and south of 630, right? Police in, police in the hood, expanding that net. Um, and so now proponents of that have lost credibility. So it's also, um, you know, just being um, as well. Hey, thank y'all. Thank y'all uh, for your thoughts on that. Uh, I want to share from the comments what people have said on this. Uh, Jamie, she says, uh, I think having more opportunities to speak in schools will help outreach in the community. I definitely agree with her on that. Uh, with the, speaking at all the schools, elementary, middle school, high schools, uh, colleges, university, junior colleges, trade schools, wherever, uh, we, we need to take advantage of more more of that because uh, that's you know saying where we can reach a big base of people uh on a regular basis so i definitely uh definitely agree with you on that jamie and uh Ra, he says we need to learn how to leverage social media and effective marketing to improve, improve our outreach definitely agree with that comment as well i think a lot of times we think people see our facebook posts our tweets and our TikToks. And in all honesty, when you go view the analytics, you'll see that the outreach ain't doing what you want to do. I'm gonna tell you right now, off top, if you put a link on your Facebook post, that's gonna already, as soon as you put that link, that, that basically already starts to downfall on your post right there because Facebook don't want you to share no type of links for free. They want you to pay in your promotional posts. So, uh, we need to learn how to use social media and we need those trainers from those social media experts. We need to learn how to geo map through all of that. So uh, got an organization, you know what I'm saying, that's, that knows what they're doing. They can do that, provide that for the organization. Please share that information as well. Or if you do it, drop your contact information in our, in our chat and I guarantee you we'll get you set up something this year to uh, work with the Freedom Fund and whatever groups want to partner with us. Uh, I'm going to keep things running along. We only got a couple more questions. And if you have any questions or comments, like I said, this is a conversation between all of us. Feel free to share. I just appreciate all y'all being here celebrating with us and working with us. Uh, my next question to y'all uh, is, how do you or your organization put Black people at the forefront of what change looks like? How do you or your organization put black people at the forefront of what change looks like? Um, I, I, I won't lead off this time since I haven't any other time. Um, I. I don't know if there's a forefront of what change looks like on um, period. I, I don't, I don't, I think things are much sort of messier and disordered than that. I think, you know, there's a good argument to be made that the, um, the, the Central American child separated from their family um, who grows up, you know, separated from their family because they're separated at the border, you know, there's a good argument that, you know, they're just as much at the forefront as us, you know, as, you know, several other sort of marginalized folks. I, I you know, I am Black, so I center Blackness. And, and I think that, you know, Black folks give Black, our, our story sort of illuminates the contradictions um, of just this country, period, right? There's no way to square our story with the purported principles um, of this, this are the stated principles of this country. And so I think by um, not trying to, to reconcile those contradictions, but to recognize that, you know, the contradiction of anti-Blackness in America is, is permanent, right? Um, it will always be with us and it forces us to challenge sort of everything that 
We've been taught in school every cultural message, every political message that we're given through the media. Um, that's 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 the power of our story, and, and our story just shows, sort of, is a testament to how resilient people can be. Um, and then when we think about Fred Hampton and, and you know the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, and, you know, that bringing about his demise. When you think about Malcolm X <clears throat> at, towards the end of his life and going to Mecca and realizing that, you know, all of these folks, you know, are being oppressed by, by the same small minority and how to, like, maneuver around that and that leading to his demise. It, it shows sort of the transformative potential and power that we have when not only we recognize like sort of the the potency, the power of our story and like dispelling all these myths about American exceptionalism, but also, you know, what happens when we sort of have a solid foundation and engage with others to bring down sort of the the the, the common um, sort of repressive forces in our society. So that's how, hopefully that makes some sense. If not, shoot, that's what you got. So Wavi went way deeper than what I <laughs> was going I appreciate it though, because I was just like, whoa, okay. Yes, I agree. And thank you for going way deep because I think um, it, it definitely set a foundation. I think for us um, being a nonprofit, a black led, indigenous led and nonprofit um, is one. And then also having an initiative of uh, honoring a culture and, and wanting to create a culture of remembrance in, uh, with folks who have been murdered um, in the state of Arkansas. And those folks are Black folks. And so um, trying to create this culture of remembrance for those people, those ancestors that have been, uh, lives have been taken, I think, does some of that. And um, we are trying desperately to make sure that uh, we are not only honoring them, but also their families, if we can uh, contact them, if we do the right genealogy and, and we connect the dots, we can uh, also uh, make sure that we're taking care of them in some way by involving them in honoring and also uh, connecting with them on what to do next and how um, how they can be involved. And so I think we try to do that uh, as much as possible. Like Omavi said, it's, it's kind of difficult uh, to do um, because it's, it's such, it's, there's so many complexities uh, that are involved in doing that, but we do try. I think starting off being Black, looking to be Black-led or Indigenous-led is part of it, um, making sure that if you are a part of an organization that is uh, in our white community or white-led, that that they're, you're asking about who's on the boards, you know what I mean? Like, what is, where's the diversity on the board? Um, uh, if there's issues about the Black community that need to be um, challenged or, or uh, care for that someone representing that community is actually doing that and doing it in a way that it's not like that here's a black face that they are genuinely uh, concerned about and are um, in solidarity with with that community and um, just learning how to enter and exit communities are very important it's very important and and we need to be able to have representation and so I, I thought this kind of was a trick question a little bit because <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious as to you know when you when we wake up every day um 
it's just hard not to center black folks, right? It's hard not to think about um, the conditions of folks right around you, right? And I like to tell people about the bubble that I uh, grew up in in Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi and the Mississippi Delta. Um, it's still a place now, um, and you know, I know Mississippi, Arkansas, all of us have these bad, you know, uh, reputations uh, with regard to race relations, but I found it to be a safe haven because in Greenwood, I can choose if I want to interact with other races um, on a daily basis. Um, I can go to uh, still find the mom and pop stores in my neighborhood, um, still have a whole block that is all black. So, I mean, just to think about just what's directly around you, it's hard not to um, center uh black folks and within our organizations uh, these same stories about what's happening right around me they're part of my daily conversations right um it's 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 my duty to ensure that we are not forgotten in these predominantly white spaces right um as well and so um as we think about um Amabi talked about a lot of our national leaders we can think about our local folks that are right around around in, that have been that have played such a pivotal role in the movements that have allowed us to have access into some of these spaces. Um, they're still here and their spirits are still here. Um, I also think that it's that little bit of black joy, too. Right. Um, that we have to take pride in and find uh, a little bit of love and black joy at, in everything, right? Uh, my grandmother used to say all the time, you can, we, do a li- we do a lot with just a little, right? Uh, and so just really holding on to those lessons and preserving them allow us to keep centering ourselves. We may not have it all. We may not have it all. We may not have a lot, right? But what we have, we can continue to, continue to build, right? As long as we keep centering um, one another. And so I think, you know, it's hard out here not not to with all of the things that come at us on a daily, right? We're just, uh, we have to, we have to keep, uh, keep our eyes uh, on one another, on black folks. All right, thank you. Thank you all for answering that. <clears throat> and it wasn't a trick question, you know what I'm saying? I just think uh, it's just a personal comment. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, um, in particular in Arkansas, a lot of times when you are known as the activist or the black organizer or the person that's, you know what I'm saying, really involved in civic engagement, people will try to recruit you for their missions and their platforms a lot of times. And they'll they'll really, you know, come in your face and hype you up about the work that you're doing because they really, really need your support and really need your network. And sometimes that kind of throws us off track a little bit with the work because, you know, we have our own priorities that we're working on. And, you know, we get pulled in a lot of times for free sometimes too. You get pulled in for free uh, because other people see our talent and they, you know what I'm saying, they just stay on us and stay in our emails and stay in our text messages about coming to support what they got going on. And then when we talk about what we got going on, all of a sudden, oh, uh, we had a meeting. I was busy, I was out of town. I had to do something for my kid or something like that. And we just like, you know, uh, something like that always happens every time we look for you. So, you know, we should all like, we want a trick question, but I think we should always keep black people at the forefront of what we're doing and look at it through the lens of what, how does it impact us in determining what we're doing our work. So just want to, just want to reiterate that to all the listeners, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think I just want to go ahead, bro. Go ahead. It looked like you was thinking when I was talking. Go ahead. I think like the trick in part is how do you do that in a way? Because like when you like when you study revolutions that were successful in toppling oppressive regimes, there was like almost without exception united fronts formed, right? Like a in China, there were multiple ethnicities that came together, Cuba, Vietnam, so on and so forth. 
I, like without doing any kumbaya stuff, it's like, I guess the trick is being able to keep Black folks in the forefront, but also when you approach an Indigenous community, when you approach a Latinx community, not creating the perception in their mind that you're saying that your struggle is more important than their struggle, right? And so it's like, how do you do both? Because if anybody came to my community and said, look, you know, the indigenous struggle, and some indigenous folks do this, say, look, black folks are settlers, right? And they put us in the same settler bucket as white folks. I'm like, man, that that's that ain't that ain't that ain't what it is, right? It turn, it's a turnoff. And so how do we keep black people at the forefront without saying that we're higher on some sort of hierarchy? I think that's that was what I was trying to get at. Already, already, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And we work. We ain't got all the answers, so we we all just working, trying to make sure that we uh continue to uplift each other doing this work. So, uh, look, my last question to y'all, and if uh, if you have any questions or any comments that you would like to share, you know, what I'm saying, please put them in the chat. Um. My last question is basically, uh, what are some needs that you feel that like should be addressed immediately in our community? And uh, what long-term work do we need to have in mind to address these needs as well? You repeat the question one time. All right. I basically, uh, I'm just asking what are some of the needs that you feel like should be addressed immediately in our community? And how do we support the change needed with the long term commitment? So Housing is a huge issue here in the state of Arkansas. And <clears throat> I think, um, as a matter of fact, you had Stacy Rutledge, no, Leslie Rutledge, uh, Leslie Rutledge, I'm sorry, I'm mixing the name, on the news doing a live today talking about the slum activity of the um, uh, landlords at one of the many apartment complexes here in the state of Arkansas that have issues with uh, inhabitability and being able to, um, for folks to have decent living spaces. And, um, and the issue is there is, Arkansas is one, actually the only state that doesn't have renters' rights. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge issue. That is That has been an issue for us for a very, very long time. And, uh, and it's okay to have a press conference and talk about it and call it out and talk about all the black mold that's making people sick and the fact that the landlords are not paying the bills or the, um, the renters who are paying their bills. But it's another thing to then enact some type of legislate some type of legislation to change that over time. So it's cool uh, to to talk about that, but I feel like that issue has been an issue for for Arkansas for years, and this is not the first time that Leslie uh, Rutledge has heard about slumlord activity. And I feel I just feel like this is an election year again. Uh, and now it's kind of coming out in the forefront when folks have been writing letters and saying all these things for many years. And so now there's a spotlight on uh, people not having uh, afford, not just affordable, but having habitable places to live. Um, 
that it has to be done that way. I mean, we we can't just have a lawsuit against an apartment management complex. We have to change the laws around how we value our citizens. The health, safety, safety, and where, welfare of the citizens of Arkansas is what's important. And if that's not valued, then what are we talking about? I mean, holding a press conference, okay, good. But for years, this has been an issue. So for me, that's the long term. That's the long term it is, is, is changing the law. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my big, that's the big issue uh, in the forefront for me in, in Arkansas. hard to um, narrow down the issue for sure. Um, but one of the challenges that I see most in my community, um, and I'm, I'm really surprised y'all beat us to it in expanded Medicaid, right? Um, so it's uh, healthcare, right? Um, and when we're not well, you know, um, that affects our day-to-day operations in our own communities uh, and amongst one another. And so I see the challenges with healthcare in places like Mississippi um, being fatal, right? They're, they're, they're fatal, let's call it what it is. And there's a lack of concern uh, for the health and well-being of our people in the state. Also, when we think about um, the black maternal health crisis, right? Um, this is something that we have that impacts black women um, across the South, right? Um, and just without the humanizing of black folks, that's what it boils down to, valuing black folks, um, thinking that we are worthy of having access to quality, not healthcare, but quality healthcare. Uh, the same systems that save other folks uh, lives, we don't have access to that, right? And that's very problematic and uh, it's, it's, it's becoming uh, increasingly more and more fatal in our communities. And these are not old folks that are dying, right? These are it's getting younger and younger. Uh, lost a good friend last week, 33 years old, a heart attack, right? Uh, with some underlying conditions and um, you know, I mean, a lot of folks just don't have access or, or um, you know, in my hometown, the hospital is on its operating off of its reserves. So we don't know how long the doors will even be open there. Uh, just this week, they have transferred patients um, to other facilities all the way to your great state in Pine Bluff, Arkansas as well, right? Uh, because of a sewage line that has collapsed. So our hospitals are um, in dire need of both fiscal and physical um, just restoration. Um, and so as I think about what's ailing us um, across the state of Mississippi, um, it's, it's, it's hard not to think about our current healthcare system, um, which, but it has allowed us to rely on our own traditions, right? Which is plant medicine, right? And really getting back to our roots of herbalism Right. Uh, I went without health care for a very long time and started studying uh, in a program uh, focusing on community herbalism. And that's how I got to community. Right. Um, but I think that that's where we that's our innovation is going to be key in terms of trying to save ourselves. Uh, yeah, well, one of the biggest and I'll second all of that. One of the biggest immediate needs uh, that I see uh, is just so much unmitigated trauma um, in our communities uh, and people feeling isolated, right? And having to go through this trauma essentially alone, children having to go through the trauma of having a parent incarcerated or killed uh, without any robust system of support a lot of times. And so, again, to Clarissa's point, I think trauma-informed mutual aid uh, is, is, is 
desperately need it so that people, you know, don't feel like they're wallowing alone, but know that they're a part of a supportive community that will help them carry, you know, whatever they're, they're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's the immediate need. Long term, I think that a few things. One, we, we, we double down on Black capitalism uh, if for no other reason because, you know, back in the day, Black entrepreneurs essentially had a captive market because white folks wouldn't sell them a lot of Black folks, right? And so, you know, they had to go to these Black entrepreneurs. But like after, you know, these civil rights gains, I mean, desegregation, you know, we had to compete with these big, big capitalists who can afford to lose money for five years to squeeze us out of the market, right? Who can like sell products cheaper than us. Um, you know, that's why things are cheaper at Walmart than they are at, um, you know, the mom and pop store down the street. So, you know, if we, if we double down on black capitalism, then, then you know, we're, we're going to continue to get what we've been getting. And so I think we need to openly critique racial capitalism. We need to we need to instill in our people that, you know, amidst so much scarcity south of 630, the idea, the idea of anybody having a billion dollars is odious, right? So the goal isn't that our is just, you know, is not desirable. The idea is not that we should work so hard to get a billion dollars and get passive income off of other people's labor so that other people will be working while we're just sitting back on the beach. Um, the, the, the idea is that everybody, everybody should have a place to live, some food to eat, health care, quality health care. And, and we can't have that within the current system. And so just like a critical disposition towards the current system, if we can instill that in folks uh, and embody that, we bring these critiques to the fore and make them a lot more digestible and understandable than I am doing right now, uh, then I think uh, we'll be in good shape. My man, Bob. So let's do it, bro. We're definitely going to do that. I appreciate y'all. Uh, engaging with us and working with us. Um, just want to share some of the comments that uh, people, uh, Rondi Davis, he mentioned, uh, as we were talking about housing, that, um, you know, big shots on Asher. It's been in the news recently for all the uh, inhabitable issues going on there, along with the crime that was going on there, and uh, how they, the city has been ignoring the issues over there that uh, the tenants I've been complaining about so and coach a also want to remind everybody along with the, uh, the housing issue that the fuel, food insecurity issues and the food deserts that are being created around black neighborhoods they just shut down uh program on colonel glenn right down the street from big chateau on Ashland. and uh that's another store predominantly black community grocery store that has been shut down over the last couple of years it's been a trend of that uh, for Rhonda mentioned, they don't want to fix the issue. They are clout chasing. I agree with her 100%. They, uh, we've been talking about renters' rights for several legislative sessions, and it's been slow uh, moving. And I think a lot of our legislators are actually landlords and property owners. And so that's been a conflict of interest with them because of uh, they would hold them accountable. Um, Kwame said, electing and continuously holding accountable municipal, county, and state officials is a political health uh, determ determinant. Stops expending all your time and energy on who was in the White House and is who was in City Hall is much more important. And I definitely agree. Uh, that's why we have to pay attention in this election cycle. Local elections matter. Uh, we have to stress that to our people and get them engaged to vote, and make sure we hold these uh, local uh, officials accountable as well. Uh, I know Ron also said that Black people don't find a way to feed ourselves. 
we are going to start. Hey, uh, feel you 100% for Rhonda. Um, before we get done, I want to make sure that I share this message from Don Jeffrey. Uh, Don, of course, is not here with us tonight because she's currently incarcerated, but she is the founder of the Little Rock Freedom. And uh, she's currently a weight citizen, so we know we to keep her uplifted. Uh, I dropped a link in the chat to support Smoke and Smudge, which is uh, selling Little Rock Freedom Fund t-shirts. These t-shirts go to support Don and the Little Rock Freedom Fund. So if you want to hit that and share that in the chat and order one, appreciate it. But here's a message from Don Jeffrey. Greetings. I want to thank everyone who set aside some time to participate in this day of action as we uplift Black-led organizers and organizations and celebrate Marcus Garvey. I'm now approaching my 14th month of incarceration and seeing the ills of the injustice systems that are destroying lives firsthand makes me want to work even harder. I also think of what, mean, what it means when we say the word Black. Have we still not discovered our nationality? Are we still discovering who we are? Those are the things we need to think about. I want us to continue to grow and build together. We cannot look to the government to save our communities. We have to take, we have to take it on, on this task ourselves. I challenge each of us to go forward with hope that we can make a difference. Please support Black-led organizations and organizers. Continue to uplift each other, boots on the ground, the work continues. Revolutionary could change happens only when an entire society is ready. No amount of action, preaching, or teaching will spark revolution in social conditions if social conditions do not want it. Peace, power, and love, Don X. Uh, we appreciate uh, those words from Don as we continue to continue to fight for her and continue to fight for what the Little Rock Freedom stands for. Hey, I appreciate everybody being here, but we're going to leave on a real high note. I want y'all to give y'all attention and show love to the righteous poets as they close us out in our day of action. Uh, I also want to tell everybody, too, as well, uh, as they get ready to come to the mic, like I said, Ashley Jeffrey has said that uh, he wants to remind everybody to buy the shirts from the link on the Smoke and Smudge websites. And also, as well, we can um, we can support Pedal to the Metal Floristry uh, for each bouquet that they uh, that is bought. A five dollar dollar donation will go to the Little Rock Freedom Fund for each bouquet sale. So that's Pedal to the Metal Floristry. I will drop the Instagram in the chat while the uh, Righteous Post perform, perform. And uh, if you want to order a T-shirt, Ashley Jeffrey. And she also says she would like to thank Little Rock Freedom Fund for all the work we're doing in the community. And she wants to thank everybody who has supported her and Don Jeffrey's family, her family and friends. That's just a message from Ashley Jeffrey, Don Jeffrey's sister. So righteous poets, man, take us home, please. All right. Okay. Uh, you, you go ahead, Jamie. All right, um, this last poem I'm doing is entitled Lessons Still Relevant. Both of my parents are teachers, so it's kind of inspired by education again. According to most grading scales, a 90% and above is an A. 80 to 89 is a B grade. 70 to 79 is a C. 60 to 69 is a D. And if you earn a 59% or less, then you've earned yourself an F. An F stands for failing not accurately getting the work done, not actually following the instructions. To fail means you did not learn what you needed to. Maybe you didn't go about practicing the right way. Maybe you didn't study enough every day, or maybe you didn't care to pass and thought, I don't need this anyway. I wonder y'all, what's the case with the world today? Did we not accurately get the work done in areas that needed to be worked on? Did we not actually follow God's instructions because we failed? Maybe we didn't go about practicing love and highlighting morals in a way that would stick. Maybe we didn't force those who were so close-minded to just try it, try accepting those who are different and loving those who are not kindred. Maybe we didn't encourage enough people to study the world in its truth, no matter how many lessons it takes. 
to read and to listen and to pay attention to this good enough comprehension to study and to study like it is your mission to pass because it should be. Life is one big exam. To study all cultures and see the beauty in all parts of the Venn diagram, to be mindful of past events and to trust history, but not history books, to challenge norms. See, studying is a big part of getting a good grade, but maybe we just wanted an easy A. Thought God will pass us if we just put it all in his name. One nation, under God. Thought we could get an A plus by not even doing much, but following the same flashcards of evil that have been going on since way before today's biblical people. Maybe we've become too complacent with our F because every class above us has left uncontrollable chaos, an undeniable divide and more failing systems than I can get out in one breath without losing the rhythm, but man, have we failed. No more study sessions filled with more subjective games that aim to favor the behaviors of the privileged whites because the majority of the minorities who are the majority of the nation don't just lose games, they lose real lives. There are some good people out there, but that doesn't mean we can just round up. We keep on failing. But what do you do when you fail a course? You just have to repeat. You just have to reteach until mastery is reached. Maybe this generation is the class that will study enough. Maybe this generation is the class that will practice enough. Maybe this generation is the class that will learn and teach and maybe will pass or at least bring us up to a D. But we all have homework to do. So I got my notes that I've been jotting and I got some ideas that I've been plotting and I'm ready to work. Thank y'all. <laughs> and, and so I know Jamie, uh, Right now, she's at JSU, Jackson State University. Yes, she's sir. a senior, yes, finna get sir. her mass comm major. I think she has, she has an RA meeting right at eight, so she might have to get out of here while we're going. But I'll go next. Um, I entitled this piece, I Woke Up One Morning. <laughs> I woke up one morning, my heart heavy. See, I don't trust like I used to. See, I realized that that's deadly. I became more realistic. I gave up on optimism. Cops to blacks are ops to hit them. See, these blocks are prisons. They got us looking through prisms. We're blind to the system, hidden to the way that we should be living. It's a lot of ignorance. No wonder why they ain't fearing us. They think we're illiterates. They're fighting us like militants. They still got us in chains. We can't seem to snatch the one that's on our brains that continues to remain. I got a question. Is half freedom really better than none? Because it's kind of like we're finally getting a plate, but the food's undone. We're being told that we're family, but being treated like a stepson. Content with the progress. Some people say we gained a ton, but I don't celebrate victories that haven't come. This war is far from one. Look, let me tell you why I think this way. Back to the other day. See, I noticed they got us brainwashed, got us working chain jobs like cooks and the janitors. Not many of us scholars and professors. It's like the white man's playing chess and we're stuck on playing checkers. They got us in check just when we thought they was going to have to king us later. But even when we get a king, they gun them down. And then when we make a stride, they make sure it don't happen again. Obama gets in the house, but why you think they made Trump win is backlash and backhanded compliments. Even success has consequence. We integrate schools for learning, the whites leave and give us the financial burden, even though they still in charge. So by and large, it loses funding. Fundamental resources become less abundant until we are close to nothing. And that's only one something, one example. This whole system is corrupt. I can only take so many punches to the gut until my core erupts. I'm so full of distrust. Interpersonal warfare got my heart feeling crushed, making it harder for me to love. I get thoughts that make peace tough. All I want is my people up, no matter what it takes. Change is slow, that's unacceptable. We need to speed up the pace. Free all my people, this is getting too heavy. I can no longer bear to wait. Lord, take it away. Thank you. Yeah. And my guy, Jacob. They always give me the hard points to follow up. Um, This poem is called, We Can We Will We Must. And yeah, I hope y'all like it. Let's change routes. We've been going down the same street for a minute and it's getting old now. Come on, y'all, let's do it different. And instead of a gang, my brother, let's start a business. You can still be the star without a star position. You either gang in a gain, and it's not a hard decision. My brothers, I love y'all. But yes, sometimes we have no goals. Sometimes we never dream. I know the hood raised you, but it's bigger, better things. See me, I was a part of the mix as well, so I know it's not perfect. Yes, I used to try to, and no, it wasn't worth it. I'm not trying to judge you, I'm just saying, make a purchase. Fellas, buy a house before you buy a watch and all these women's purses. Cause sometimes they with you for the service. They right beside your Bentley, but nowhere close when it comes to hearses. When you get locked up, 
She's not going to take the time to write a cursive. She's not going to lick that envelope and spray that paper with some perfume. She says she want to hook them, but she complained about your curfew. Little did she know you out here trapping just to feed your nephew. She don't know you out here facing dangers. You facing massacres. They got 40s that are blow. That's a caliber. Them bullets big. You better run like a Mustang and try and dodge. That's a challenge. Of fellas, mm. we got to shape. We got to do something new. We say we all grinding for the city, but really, is that true? See, fellas, we all could be Superman, but really, we are each other's kryptonite. Everybody want to be a thug. Everybody want to be a crypt tonight, and it's such a shame because they think they thugs, they seen a prison game. You're not a thug because you've been a prison mate. You're not a thug to your food missing on your dinner plate. You're not a thug to you in their hands like it's all state. you not a thug to you until they go in the hand of your father when he disclaimed you, you know y'all got the same traits. See me, I got a day with destiny and I cannot be late. And I'm just keeping it on the real like fishing bait, ladies. Ooh. See, sometimes y'all are no better. See, I wrote this because sometimes y'all be acting. Quit looking for a man to make you happy and look for some balance. Ladies, you are so smart, but yet you can be so close-minded. All y'all want to do is shop. You're so close-minded. Instead of coming together and getting some money. I see y'all beat each other down hour for hour. Y'all chase these wannabe rappers like Hakeem who wants your cookie but don't want to build your empire. See, if I'm lying, I'm dying. And I'm not dead yet, so here's the topic. We got to start using logic to get out the gossip that's not making us profit. If we use our cars correctly, we can get out of anything. Opportunities are everywhere. Who cares if the government don't want to give one? I know that the system is messed up, and instead of preaching testimonies, we're more likely to live one. But think about it. We weighed better than before. They used to kill us if we didn't have the fields done. We got to do better, my brothers and sisters. We can do better, my brothers and sisters. We must do better, my brothers and sisters. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so we are the Righteous Poets uh, here in Central Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, my sister, she put uh, our our Instagram tag, our Facebook tag in the chat. Um, I'll copy and paste that and put that back in there if y'all don't have it. Um, but yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you for it having was us. Very, honor. It was very engaging conversation. We learned a lot over here. We was we was we was talking about what y'all was what talking y'all was about. Like we was having a conversation, discussion yeah. about it too, yeah. since we we kind of in the same room. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was it was very fun tonight, and yeah. I wish uh, peace and blessings to everybody. To everybody, thank you for having us. Hey, thank y'all to the righteous poets for being here with us tonight. Hey, I, I'm gonna talk. I'll be talking to y'all very soon this week, and uh, I appreciate everybody that joined us tonight. Um, just put it on your radar. Little Rock Freedom Fund will be doing some work in the community, uh, and you'll be seeing us out in the public. So, you know, what I'm saying uh, we'll be doing an event for people coming up real soon uh, around voter education, uh, voter information, and community engagement. And so, uh, just tap in with us. I got your email addresses. Uh, check out the Righteous Poets website. Check out Pedal to the Metal. Check out Smoke and Smudge. Uh, check out LittleRockFreedomFund.com. Hey, and thank you again to Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement for allowing us to hijack the Zoom for a little bit tonight. Thank you, Clarice. Uh, and I appreciate all the speakers, Omavi Shapur, Bridget Gray, Reese Abdul Bay, and everybody in attendance. Y'all be blessed and have a, uh, have a great evening, all right? Thank you. All right. Peace. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Y'all have a good night. All right. Good night. Good night.